grasping God's reluctance, but rather laying hold to God's willingness, which is rooted in the promises of God, in the power of prayer, and through the strength of the Spirit. Church, please take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 14. Once you've found your place in sacred scripture, please stand out of reverence for the public reading of God's holy word. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will go worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went up together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they had reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. talk about the Messiah of Mount Moriah. The Messiah of Mount Moriah. For 52 years, I have sailed
in areas in the deep innermost recesses of our being. And it finds us as we walk along the thin places of life where no other human feet can walk. And this text that is not new, but this text that is vibrant catches up with us. D.L. Moody is right. It's not how many times you've been through the Bible. It's how many times the Bible has been to you. I hope that this text will meet us at places in virgin territory where we have never experienced it before. Here it is, Mount Moriah. We come there. But not the Mount Moriah in 2 Chronicles 3 and 2, where Solomon builds his temple on Mount Moriah in that first and second verse. No, I'm talking about the Mount Moriah of our experience. The Mount Moriah where the burden intersects with the blessing. Mount Moriah, where the holy hunch connects with the holy hush. Mount Moriah, where laughter and lamentation connects. Mount Moriah, where misery and mercy interpenetrate. Mount Moriah, where singing and sighing collide. Mount Moriah, where you and I just might have to believe in the God of the promise, when it looks like the promise of God is not going to be fulfilled. I hope that we will come to this text and say to it, sing it over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And God, sometime later, tempted Abraham. That's what the authorized version, the King James Version says. But when we read James chapter 1, verse 13, it says that God cannot be tempted of anyone, neither does God tempt anyone. So the word really is not tempted, it's tested. God tested Abraham. He tested him to refine him. Temptation is for the purpose of destruction. Testation is for the purpose of construction, where God is refinishing us, conforming us after the image of his dear son. It's what God does to Job in Job 23 and 10. And Job confesses it. He knows the way I take. And after he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. In that great hymn, How Firm a Foundation, the flame shall not harm thee. I only desire thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And if God tested Abraham, and even Jesus is put to the test, God will test you. You and I are not exempt from the testing of God so that our faith can be tried and refined. He tested Abraham. And he said, Abraham, and Abraham's response must be ours. Here I am. Take your son. Well, I've got two. Your only son. The son you love. I love both of them, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac, whose name means laughter. And this is no laughing matter. It's a time for lamentation. Take him. Because he's yours by relationship. He's mine by ownership. I brought him from a dead womb, and I'm going to bring him to the very edge of a dead tomb. Take him and offer him as a burnt offering. This anticipates Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What an oxymoron. What a paradox. Because a paradox occurs when two mutually exclusive statements meet at the intersection of apparent contradiction 
only to produce truth. It's G.K. Chesterton who says that a paradox is truth standing on its head, screaming for attention. As if to say, I know this looks strange, it's illogical, it's unreasonable, but if you come closer, I have something to say to you. Offer up your son as a burnt offering. And how can that be? Because a burnt offering means a holocaust. That's really the word. Everything is cremated. Everything is burned up. Nothing left. And yet God is not a promoter of child sacrifice. Plus, doesn't the promise of God lie in Isaac? No. The promise of God lies in God. And therefore, we see this, this unsteady, uneven like statement by God. Take him and offer him up as a burnt offering. A paradox, a paradox like Jesus. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to follow him paradoxically. He doesn't make sense. He's not logical. He's super logical. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are inscrutable. They're past finding out. His ways are higher than our ways. And therefore, if you're going to follow him, if you really want to live, you have to be willing to die. If you want to be exalted, you have to be willing to be humbled. If you want to be first, you have to be willing to be last. If you want to be great, you have to be willing to be a servant. If you want to sit at the head of the table, you have to be willing to sit at the end of the table. If you want to find your life, you've got to be willing to lose your life. And Paul picks up from this paradoxical nature of the speech of Christ and says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, I glory in my weaknesses, in my hindrances, in my insults, in my persecution, in my difficulties. For when I am weak, that is really when I am strong because I lean on him and discover that my strength really resides in him. Take and offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. We want the blessing of the manifestation of God, which will take place on Mount Moriah. But we're hesitant to obeying the word of revelation in Genesis chapter 12 because God is a show and tell God. And God says to Abraham, leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your acquaintances and go to a place that I will tell you about. Chapter 22 would never have occurred had it not been for Abraham's obedience in chapter 12. He would not have seen the blessing of the manifestation of God. And therefore, God calls us, brothers and sisters, to obedience. If we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what the glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And to all who will trust and obey, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Take him, burn him up on one of the mountains I'm going to show you. It is still this walk by faith. In verse 3, Abraham gets up in the morning and cuts enough wood for the burnt offering and prepares to take his servants with him along with Isaac. The servants never have anything to say. They're just there to be witnesses because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. They never speak a word. We have a tendency to mannequinize biblical characters, make them plastic saints, as if they have no emotion. Abraham got up the next morning. Who said he went to bed? How do you sleep when you know that God will point you out to a place where you will take that knife and stab it into the heart of your son? Do you know what it's like to be sleepless? That night, knowing that you're going to have surgery the next day, and you hope that after the surgery is over, they will say, we got it all. Do you know what it's like to go to a courtroom where someone that you love might be put away for 25 years, and you're praying that the judge will acquit that person? How do you sleep at night? I think that Abraham did not sleep and snore. Why? Because he's of the human constitution. 
James A. Sanders has said, very well, biblical characters do not primarily serve us as models for morality, but rather as mirrors for identity. Mirrors for identity, so that we can identify with the biblical character. Not a plastic saint, not a mannequin, but one who has flesh and blood and has feelings like we have feelings. And Abraham got up and cut enough wood for the sacrifice and took the two servants along with his son Isaac. And God is his traveling system, his GP, what do you call it, son? GPA. Guiding him. Every step he takes, God will say, yeah. Because there are a lot of mountains there. But God said, a mountain. And it seems as if this is a matter of divine insensitivity and cruelty on God's part. Three days. We read the text really fast because between verse 3 and 4, there are three days. And the Bible says on the third day, verse 4, God said, that's the place. But we're not told what happened on the first day, the second day, or the third day. I mean, what do you do in three days? There's no conversation that's in the text at all. What do you talk about in three days? You cannot not think in three days. What do you talk about? I like to think that Abraham had some serious questions to ask God. Well, you say, well, you don't ask God questions. You can ask God questions without questioning God's character. Joseph struggled at first until he saw the epilogue of what God was doing. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to me for good. Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And oh, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet in chapter 20, verse number 9, verse number 7 particularly says, oh God, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me. You pinned me down because you're stronger than I am. You've made me a laughing stock. Therefore, he took out the resignation that he had been carrying around for a long time and read it before the Lord. I said I would not speak anymore in his name, but his word was in my heart like fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weaver holding it in. Indeed, I could not. I know that you've never done that. I know what it's like to write a resignation and carry it around and just decide on that Sunday you're going to read it. And God says, no. Between Jeremiah's, I said I would not. And his, but I could not, was the word that was in his heart like fire shut up in his bones, and he was weary of holding it in. Indeed, he could not. Hear me when I tell you, be real with God. God is not fragile. He's faithful. And he already know, oh, I don't talk to God like that. Well, Psalm 139 verse 2 says, he knows my thoughts afar off, which means before I get the thought, God abducts the thought. God kidnaps the thought. God interprets the thought before you get the thought. And therefore, you just as well as tell God how you feel. If you think he's mismanaging your ministry, tell him how you feel. I know some pastors, when Hurricane Katrina came, and they were building a church, and the congregation was growing, and now people went to the four corners of the earth, and they had some serious questions to ask God. Ask God, why is it that the dope dealer and the pimp and the prostitute, they're driving fine cars and living in great houses, and here I am struggling, trying to make ends meet. Why do the rich, rich people prosper and the righteous suffer? God will give you the first word, but he always reserves the last word. And he'll let you, Job, go on and talk for 35 chapters from chapter 3 to chapter 37. Go on and talk, Job. Tell me what you think about it. Huh? You said you're upset that you were born, and you cursed today. You're gone. Talk, talk, talk. And in chapter 38, God said, Yo, I just have a few chapters. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the 39, 40, 41? And then God said, now, did you say you wanted to say something? Yes, I heard of you with my ears, but now I've seen you face to face. And you know what God said to Job? He said to Job what he had said to Job in chapter 1 and chapter 2. My servant Job, because there is no annulment and no cancellation of your relationship with him. Go on and tell Jesus how you feel. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. Jesus will help me. Jesus alone. I must. It's not an option. I must. It is an imperative. Tell him. 
and watch him give you more faith because God would rather for you to shake your fist in his face than to strut and walk away with your back turned on him. Learn to pray the prayers of lamentations in the psalm, not just thanksgiving, but tell him how you feel. They get there three days. We don't know what's taking place. But if I was Abraham, I sure would have asked God, God, how is it that you could call me from you the Chaldees, the breadbasket of the universe, embraced by the Tigris and Euphrates River, everything is growing. And the first place I set foot on in the promised land is Shechem, and there's a famine there, and I have to hightail it down to Egypt. How is that that I leave Operation Breadbasket to come to a famine-stricken land? How is it? And surely you will deliver me from the situation. Surely you will save Isaac, because when I took Anne, tried to recapture Lot. I could have lost my life, but you not only kept my life, you helped me to get my nephew back. And God, when we tried to uh, uh, kind of add an addendum to your plan, because we looked at our biological clocks, and I went on and had intercourse with Hagar, my, my wife's handmaid, but you didn't accept that. Here comes Ishmael at 86 years of age. He's the father of the Arabs. 14 years later, here comes Isaac, who's the father of the Jews. And for 4,000 years, the Jews and the Arabs have been fighting because when we try to help God out, we wind up messing up things. He doesn't need a plan B. Calvary is not plan B. Calvary is plan A. And Calvary took place in the mind of God before God ever stood on nothing and spoke something from nothing and everything existed. Because the Bible tells us in Revelation 13 and 8 that John looked behind himself and he saw a lamb that looked like it had been slain from, 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 before the foundation of the world. God never reacts to anything. God preacts before there's anything to act upon. Maybe God, maybe you will be the one because you protected me and you said in Genesis 15 and 1, Abram, Abram. Behold, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And God, even before my wife Sarah conceived, you told me in your covenantal pact in Genesis 17 and 19, your wife shall have a son and even gave his name. His name shall be Isaac. No conception. And then to confirm that, you sent three messengers, and one of them is called the Lord, who said... By this time next year, she's going to have a child. And in verse 21, Isaac is born. And you said out of Isaac, out of his seed, not seeds, but seed, the whole world going to be blessed. Surely now, God, you're asking me, not asking me, telling me, take my son, my only son, the son I love, Isaac, and take him on one of the mountains. Here it is, Mount Moriah, and offer him as a sacrifice. And you don't believe in child sacrifices. Plus, the question is, how will he produce seed if he's dead? He's not married. There are no children. You are in a divine dilemma. How are you going to get out of this one? And the challenge for Abraham, the challenge for us is, can I trust in the God of the promise when it looks like the promise of God is not going to be fulfilled? Three days from Beersheba, where Abram, Abraham and Sarah live, to Mount Moriah. Three days of painstaking thinking. Three days of looking at his son, never knowing which mountain he would have to say goodbye to Isaac. Three days of pondering, pain, perplexity. And now he comes to that place. God says, that's the place, Mount Moriah. Hmm. Those three days were not for God. Those three days were for Abraham. It took Abraham three days to come to the place where he would offer Isaac on the altar that Isaac must be offered on, the altar of his heart. Isaac was now just as good as dead because Abraham, after talking it over with God, trusted God enough that even though he did not know how, he knew who. Because that was the struggle. Abraham did not doubt the who-ness of God. 
He struggled with the highness of God. How are you going to fulfill your promise with a dead Isaac? That's our struggle. It's the highness of God. And somehow or the other, the Hebrew writer under the inspiration of the Spirit peeped over the shoulders of the triune God and wrote these words in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, that Abraham reasoned that if it was necessary for God to raise up Isaac from the dead in order to keep his promise, he could do it because Isaac came from death because Sarah was postmenopausal, which meant there was no possibility for her to have a child. Can you imagine a 90-year-old woman going to a gynecologist and having that baby, and then the Blue Cross Blue Shield has to process the records? Makes no sense. But sometimes God waits until you get to the very end of possibility, whatever it is. Before you can trust God and to know that God is the God who knows the end before the beginning begins, he's willing to offer up his son on the altar of his heart. You long for sweet peace and for faith to increase. You have earnestly, fervently prayed, but you cannot find rest or be perfectly blessed till you're all on the altar is laid. Is our all on the altar, a sacrifice laid, not just when we got saved, but it's a sanctifying act. It's ongoing, wherein we are being changed from glory to glory. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, in your heart does the Spirit control. You can only be blessed and find peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. And now God says to Abraham, that's the place. And Abraham says to these servants who are there just to witness, not to testify at that moment, stay here while the boy and I, and I go up to the top of Mount Moriah, and then we are going up there to worship, and then we are coming back. How can that be? We are going up for a whole burnt offering. Hmm. No, we're coming back. Hmm. Because as we offer ourselves, we worship. That's the sense of Romans 12 and 1. Therefore, I appeal to you, brothers, that you present your bodies living sacrifice holy, except unto God, which is your service of spiritual worship. And there's Abraham struggling. But now he's reached the place where the who-ness of God is greater than the how-ness of God. That the how-ness is God's business. If we can keep our minds on the who and not understand the how, the where, the when, or any other question you might want to ask. As long as I can say I know who, I don't know about tomorrow. I'm telling you, I don't live from, I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from the sunshine for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry about the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today he walks beside me, for he knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know he holds my hand. He is the God before the past. He is the God after the future. He is the God in between. In the beginning, God. In the end, God. And in between, God. It's God all the way through. Trust the who when you don't know the how or the why or the when or the where. When there are no crops in the field, when there are no cattle in the stall, when there are no figs on the tree, when there are no grapes on the vine, say as Habakkuk says in Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, Yet will I trust in God my Savior. And Abraham and Isaac began to make their trek, their walk up Mount Moriah. And Isaac is inquisitive. He's observant. Father, this is the most unusual sacrifice I've ever been on. I see the wood. I see the fire, probably the flint stone that could be rubbed together to create a spark. But what's missing? I... I don't see the lamb for the sacrifice. And Abraham says, 
my son, listen to it now. God himself will provide a lamb for the sacrifice because God himself will be the sacrifice. Jesus does not bring an offering. He is the offering. He doesn't bring a lamb. He is a, that question. My son, God will provide. Where is the lamb? It lingers. It reverberates throughout the corridor of time for 2,000 years. And then John the Baptist answers the question in John 1, 29. There he is. <laughs> Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world 2,000 years waiting. And if humanity could wait 2,000 years, why is it that we can't wait for a month? We say to God, order my steps in your word, dear Lord. He wants to order not only your steps, but your stops. And our problem is with divine synchronicity. We want to step when he says stop, and we want to stop when he says step. And God wants to order both so that we arrive at his divine purpose for our lives. They're walking up the mountain. I hope you can see them. We read the Bible too quickly. Every step Abraham realizes could be the last one that he will have with his son. And as they go up and they get to that place, Abraham arranges the altar, places the wood on top of the altar, binds Isaac. Don't let artists misconstrue what's going on here. Isaac is not some little five-year-old boy. When Abraham saw Isaac for the first time, Abraham was 100 already. Isaac probably is a teenager. He could outrun Abraham if he wanted he could outfinagle Abraham if he wanted. He probably could outpower Abraham if he wanted. But willingly, I hope you see the Messiah on Mount Moriah. <laughs> willingly, he laid down his life. And he's in a position of crucifixion. There, being bound because the nails did not hold the Messiah on the cross. It really was love. He could have called, oh, Lord, help me. He could have called down 12 legions of angels, 6,000 in each. That's 72,000 angels. All it took was just one under Jehoshaphat's, or rather under Hezekiah's regime, one to kill 185,000 Assyrians. But it didn't. And there Abraham lifts up that knife, looking in the eyes of Ike, saw him. Remember the time he cut the umbilical cord. Remember the time he taught him how to play marbles. Remember the time when he used to burp, burp him. Sweat coming down. Hand trembling. Like a phlebotomist. I hate phlebotomists who have to stick you a hundred times to get blood. No. He wants to make one sharp entry wound right into the heart so it'll be all over. And just when he gets ready to do this, just in the nick of time, because God is not on Kronos time, calendar time. He's on Kairos time. He is appointed time, just at the right time, Romans 5 and 8. Mm. God sent an angel, and that angel said, Abraham, not once. Abraham, twice, because whenever God calls your name, twice, it means it's urgent. In Genesis 12, verse number 10 and 11, Abraham, Abraham. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, Moses, Moses, take off the shoes from your feet. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. In 1 Samuel 3 and 10, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, speak, Lord, your servant is hearing. In Luke 10, 41 and 42, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. You're all twisted up. You're all contorted. But Mary has chosen the best part that should not be taken away from her. In Luke 22, 31 and 32, and 33 and 34, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to sift you as weak. But I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And after you have turned back, strengthen the brothers. And oh, can we not forget... That great word in Acts 9 and 4, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? God may be calling your name, Michael, Michael, Robert, Robert, Charles, Charles, Randy, Randy, Jane Ellen, Jane Ellen, Susan, Susan, June, June. And whenever you sense that word of urgency,
emergency, some moment in your life where a decision has to be made, you ought to say, speak, Lord. You ought to tell somebody, no matter what they're saying to you, hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. It sounds like Jesus. And in just that nick of time, God stopped him. And the angel of the Lord said to him, now I know that you fear God more than you fear anything else because you would not withhold your son, your only son from me. Mm. Now you know what I've always known. But it was not enough for me to give you a lecture. You had to experience. Your experience had to catch up with the exegesis of my word. So now you understand that ultimately Isaac is not yours. He's loaned to you. He's mine. And I use him for a purpose. Look over there. There is a ram caught in the bush, in the thicket by its horn. Thicket, woods, thicket, woods, by its horns, his head, thicket, woods, pots. And I want to think that that ram was caught by his horns in the thicket before Abraham and Isaac start going up Mount Moriah. It was pre-planned. It was not accidental, coincidental, incidental. It was providential. And as God orchestrated the death of Jesus in that great word in Acts 2, 23 and 24, God, according to his predetermined counsel, allowed Jesus to be handed over to the chief priests, scribes, and elders and to die. Don't close out the verse. But on the third day, God raised him from the dead. I wish you could see him. He is cut by the thicket, by a crown of thorns mm, on his head. And that ram is brought. That's where you have the double type. Isaac is a type, but this ram is a type. It's a double type of the Messiah. And Abraham offers him up in the place of Isaac. Uh, and they will go back to Beersheba, and there will be great rejoicing. It's what we call vicarious suffering of the substitutionary atonement for, of God for us. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. He took the whipping that I really did deserve. Well, this is a great episode. And it's one that is a foretaste of what really takes place on Calvary. That's why we should never forget Calvary. I know it's not popular in some places to have a cross outside, a cross in uh, the sanctuary, and preachers are preaching the gospel, but not really the gospel. Uh, they are preaching the gossip. They are preaching something, but it's a crossless gospel. And, oh, brothers and sisters, God calls us to preach the gospel. That's really what happens in Luke 9, 31, when Jesus is being transfigured on uh, Mount of Transfiguration. The Bible says that the only thing that Jesus and Moses and Elijah talked about was the exodon, the word for exodus, which is the emphasis, the death of Christ. That Moses and Elijah would come all the way from heaven to have their eternal rendezvous and vacation in heaven interrupted to come down here to talk about the cross. And yet we stand up every Sunday sometimes and the cross does not even get a footnote. I will cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I hear Elie uh, who was the Jewish uh, brother who just died a few years ago, who was the Nobel Peace Prize winner, who said, I'm glad that I'm a Jew and not a Christian because the father of the Jews, Abraham, did not kill his son. But I want to tell you, and I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just trying to tell you, I'm glad that I'm a Christian because the father did have his son killed. Don't you hear Paul saying in Romans 8, 32, God who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, shall 
he not with him forgive forgive us give us freely all things i serve a god who allowed the knife to come down and i serve a god who allowed his son to die on the cross but uh, what charges my soul is early Sunday morning, he rises from the dead. You see, 2,000 years, there was a transaction. There were uh, installment payments made on my salvation. Every year uh, during Yom Kippur, Every year during uh, the great day of atonement, a sacrifice was made uh, on my behalf. It was an installment payment. It never paid the full debts. And one day, justice said to mercy, when will you pay off the debts? And mercy said, it's coming one day. The psalmist says in Psalm 85 and 10, mercy and truth met together, and righteousness and peace kiss each other. It was a foretaste of what God was going to do. But one day on the cross, when Jesus died, the Bible says that the train, the, the veil in the temple, the covering in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And Elvina M. Hall saw what was taking place. And she saw that our debt was being paid. When the veil was torn from top to bottom. She picked up a pen of inspiration and dipped it in the ink of illumination. And she said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I'm debt is full, paid off. I'm set free because of what the Lord did for me. And one of these days, when life is over, one of these days, when I breathe my last, and somebody tells you, Robert Smith is dead, don't you believe him? I'll be more alive than I've ever been before. As soon as my feet strike Zion, I will pass from time to eternity, and I'll give him praise. I'll give him glory. I'll celebrate his name, for he is the Messiah of Mount Moriah.